What is up, fight fans? Welcome to my podcast, also known as the MMA Anomaly Show. I'm your host, Olin Stewart, aka MMA Anomaly. And if you're new here, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and smash that bell for notifications. Welcome back to another episode of the MMA Anomaly Show. In this episode, I'm going to be covering the aftermath of UFC 276. It was another amazing pay-per-view for the books, uh, another great international fight week. And I will say, though the fights were absolutely amazing and definitely delivered, it did feel a little lackluster, but maybe that's just me because I just I put so much weight and hope into it. And I also feel like we're all still reeling from the amount of finishes we got recently with UFC Austin. But... Without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the card. Starting with the main event, we had Israel Adesanya going in against Jared Cannonier. Um, it went exactly as I thought it was going to go. Jared Cannonier brought the power, he brought the endurance, but in the end, it just wasn't enough to compare or compete with Israel, the last style bender, Adesanya. Um, Adesanya put on an absolute masterclass. He went out there, he utilized amazing footwork, he utilized incredible distancing, and some of the things that he did best were making sure that he was landing shots while completely making his opponent hit air. There were multiple times where it seemed like he was having his opponent almost run towards him and just making him miss, like a matador making the bull charge towards him and miss. So again, absolutely amazing performance for the last style bender. And obviously what's next for him is Alex Pajeda. It's his, you know, long lost rival, the only guy that's knocked him out. And now he's come back to haunt him from the past, right? Uh, I, I don't think that this ends up happening to him again in mixed martial arts with four ounce gloves and with wrestling being a factor. I just think that Alex Pajeda, this is the worst time for him to fight Israel Adesanya because Adesanya is at the top of his game and Pajeda is still very much new to the sport of mixed martial arts and still learning. In the next matchup, we had an amazing battle between, and this was the third time we've seen this fight actually, Alexander the Great Volkanovsky coming in to take on Max Blessed Holloway. Um, I really thought Max Holloway was going to present more problems in this fight than he did. I thought he was going to come in with a slightly different game plan, but that just wasn't the case. He simply wasn't able to land takedowns. He tried to make the footwork work for him, but it just didn't. Alexander Volkanovsky, ladies and gentlemen, is an absolute machine inside and outside of the cage, and it shows. He literally looked like a Terminator when he was in there inside of that cage with Max. He made him miss, he made him pay, he outlanded him, and honestly, I don't think Max won a single round of that fight. Whereas in the last two fights, you could at least argue whether or not you thought Max won at least two or three out of the five rounds. In this match, it was absolute domination from Alexander Volkanovsky. And I personally think that he's absolutely correct in what he said. He could very well go up to 155 pounds and give most of that division a lot of problems. So what do I think should be next for this guy? Probably going up to 155 pounds and facing somebody like an Islam Makachev or fighting a Dustin Poirier. Um, let me know what you think of those matchups below and how you see those matchups playing out. In the next fight down, we had Alex Pajeda going in against Sean the Psychopath Strickland. Uh, that fight went exactly how I thought it would. Sean Strickland marched forward uh, with reckless abandon. He assumed that his jab was going to be enough to piece up Alex Pajeda. And again, it just simply wasn't enough to, to win him the match. He kept his hands down as he usually does, which is a very bad habit, especially when you're going against someone that happens to be a better or more gifted striker than yourself. And he paid for it. He marched forward, he ate the left hook of death, the kiss of death, and he went down. He ate a couple of extra follow-up shots and he, he got sent packing. I do think he'll bounce back from this and become a better fighter. Do I think he'll have a run for the title? Probably not, even he doesn't think he will. He says himself, he's not the greatest fighter you'll ever see, but he always tries his best to put on entertaining fights, and I think he does a pretty damn good job at that. Now again, what do I think is next for Alex Pajeda? Obviously, he should end up getting the fight against Israel Adesanya, especially since Israel Adesanya already gave it his stamp of approval. With him being the champion, it's pretty much a done deal. They just have to sign a couple of dotted lines. In the next fight, we truly had a fight for the ages. It was... Robbie, the ruthless one, Lawler, going up against Brian Barbarena. Brian Barbarena's nickname right now is Bam Bam. I personally think that we as fans should notion for it to be changed to the Barbarian or Barbaric because, my God, 
That guy is an absolute barbarian in there. He went up against an absolutely game opponent in Robbie Lawler. Huge Robbie Lawler fan. Uh, had the pleasure of getting to see him fight live in San Jose years back. And he he just he's like a fine wine. He just keeps getting better with age as far as you know being fun to watch. His last fights that he's won were against people that are definitely on the wrong side of time, like a Nick Diaz. However, coming in here against a young gun like Brian Barberena, who is also a veteran of the sport in his own right, he was he was holding his own up until he wasn't. Um, Brian Barberena ended up just finishing him with a crazy good flurry in the uh, second round, I believe, and it, it was beautiful. Just late in the round, he, he still couldn't knock him out, but Robbie Lawler is just too tough for his own good at sometimes, and the referee did him a favor, ran in there, stopped the fight uh, as I feel he should have. Now, I wish I could say this next fight went exactly as it should have gone, but it simply didn't. Uh, we had Pedro Munoz going in against the sugar show, Sean O'Malley. Sean O'Malley, as most people know, he's a huge fan favorite. A lot of people were taking him to win. Uh, I think he was actually the favorite for whatever reason in that fight. Not really sure why, but he was, and uh, he really shouldn't have been. So for as long as the fight lasted, Pedro Munoz outlanded Sugar Sean O'Malley on both strikes and significant strikes and he was landing at a 10% higher clip, so 10% more accurate with his strikes. Um, if you watch the fights, you know that the fight ended in a no contest. Sean O'Malley, he kicked him in the nuts, he poked him in the eyes, I mean, just foul after foul, and after the eye poke, it was just all bad. Uh, Pedro couldn't see out of his eye, and the fight was stopped. There are some people online saying that Pedro Munoz wanted out of that fight, I tell you, I tell those people, please go and look up his record. Look at that guy's resume and see that he has fought far more dangerous killers than Sean O'Malley could ever dream of being. So there's not a chance in hell that he wanted out of that fight. He probably wanted to not get poked in the eye in that fight. He probably wanted to not get kicked in the nuts in that fight, but those things happened. And unfortunately he had to bow out. I hope that we get to see a rematch between those two because I think Pedro Munoz tears him apart. Again, let me know what you think in the comments below. If that fight would have continued, how did you see it going? In the next fight, we had a super exciting quick finish. We had Brad Riddell going up against Jalen the Tarantula Turner. Again, it I, I saw this fight possibly going both ways. I thought if it's going to get finished, it's going to be Jalen Turner. If it's a decision win, probably going to be Riddell just because of the endurance and the pressure that he applies. But my God, you want to talk about pressure? Jalen Turner put it on him. He finished him with a very quick submission. He uh, got that quick guillotine on him. And honestly, just like I said in one of my previous videos uh, in regards to Armin Sarukian's next fight, I think Armin Sarukian versus Jalen Turner is an incredible fight. Not only for both men involved, but for us as fans, we will all win on that night. That is guaranteed to deliver fireworks. And speaking of fireworks, happy 4th of July, everybody. Continuing with the theme of fireworks, we had another fireworks banger of a fight here in two legends going against each other. We had Jim Miller going up against Donald Cowboy Cerrone. And both of these guys are fan favorites. Both of these men are legends. And again, the fight went pretty much how I thought it was going to go. Uh, Cowboy Cerrone has a notorious history of being a somewhat slow starter, and that was definitely the case in this fight. He started off slow. Jim Miller put the pressure on him very quickly. Um, they almost clashed kicks, and then right off of that, Jim Miller snapped into a guillotine, jumped a, a I think it was like a hand, uh, an arm in guillotine, and just subbed him out in round two. And then, of course, after that, Donald Cowboy Cerrone took his gloves off, put him inside of the cowboy hat in the center of the octagon and said he's done fighting he's going to go and be an actor now so thank you for the memories you've been nothing but incredible to the sport and as a longtime fan of mixed martial arts and ufc i can honestly say win lose or draw donald cowboy cerrone does not know how to be a part of a boring fight going down the rest of the card in the next fight we had uriah hall going up against andre muniz and uh, muniz just he put it on him and he had a dominant win over Uriah Hall. Uriah Hall, as of recently, has kind of looked like a, uh, a shadow of his former self. I personally am kind of looking for him to switch camps, get, you know, maybe, maybe go down to American Kickboxing Academy or go to like an ATT, just change things up a bit, get some new cooks in the kitchen, so to speak, because right now the sauce ain't working. This next fight, in my opinion, was kind of a pick -em. We had Macy the Future Barber going up against Jessica Evil Eye. Uh, again, you have a young up-and-comer going up against someone who's on the wrong side of time. But realistically, if they fought in their primes, I think Jessica Eye beats her. 
That doesn't matter though, because she didn't fight her in her prime. We got an aging Jessica I, who seemingly had one foot out the door and was already ready to retire. She did put on a decent fight against Barber, but Barber seemingly was just one step ahead of her from the very start. She stayed ahead of her on the footwork. Macy Barber did show vast improvements. She was keeping her head off the center line, which usually is not the case, so great job. And also her uh, ability to keep things where she wanted them, control the pace of the fight, and put eye in a clinch whenever she wanted her there. Beautifully done. So hats off to Macy Barber. Definitely looking forward to seeing her next fight. And I'm very intrigued to see who the matchmakers pair her up against next. In the next fight, we had Ian the Future Gary going up against Gabe Green. Uh, I thought Gabe Green was going to go in there and just show his show his steel, get it done, and uh, you know get it done through grit and tenacity. It looked like he did hurt Gary on the feet a little bit. Uh, the strikes were pretty close, but Gary did everything he needed to do to win that fight. He, again, showed vast improvements. He wasn't quite as hittable as he usually appears to be. Then again, Gabe Green is a very powerful striker, but he's not necessarily the most finesseful fighter you'll ever see on the roster. So I do look forward to seeing Gary break into the top 15 and really get paired against some of the other men in the top 15. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing his career move forward. I think a lot of people hate on him, myself included because he makes himself an easy target by saying things like he's the best on the mic. The only people that are as good as him are Chael Sonnen and Conor McGregor. I mean, when you say things like that, you really have to be good on a mic and Ian Gary just isn't there yet. So I do look forward to watching his next performance in the Octagon. I might hold off on listening to his next few interviews, but that's just me. In the next fight, we had a fighter that I've definitely been keeping a close eye on, Drikas Duplessis, AKA DDP. And he was going in there against Brad Tavares, who obviously is a veteran of the UFC, a veteran of mixed martial arts, and a very game opponent no matter who he's going in there against. He put it on DDP for a good minute, but Drikas Duplessis, though he looked kind of like a caveman in there at some points, he was just lumbering forward, throwing his whole body in. I mean, he, he won the fight pretty dominantly, and I... I even though I don't really understand his style at all times, he's very exciting to watch and uh, very baffling to watch at the same time. Uh, please let me know below in the comments what you actually thought of Drikas Duplessis' performance and how far you think he can actually travel up the rankings based on his skill set currently. And then of course, starting off the fight card, starting off the early prelims, we had a snap, crackle, pop to the action. We had Julia Stur Stolarenko, uh, and instead of Stolarenko, she stole her arm hole. Uh, yeah, so she stole <laughs> Jessica Rose Clark's arm. She literally just snapped it in an arm bar. I'll try and throw a clip up there. If you're squeamish, maybe don't watch the clip. Um, maybe skip past. Either way, uh, great performance by Julia. She was on, I believe, a three or four fight skid before this, coming into this fight. Whereas uh, JRC, Jessica Rose Clark, was looking absolutely amazing coming into this fight. She had just started polishing her wrestling. She wasn't afraid to put on a quote-unquote boring technical fight because she knew she was getting the win and getting twice the paycheck. Um, and I personally thought that this was the beginning of a, a newfound Jessica Rose Clark. But instead, she went out there and she just she got submitted pretty quickly. Uh, so... Looking forward to seeing what's next for both of these ladies. Um, I don't think this is a, a one-time thing for Julia, and I think that she might be someone to watch in this division moving forward. Uh, that being said, I hope that Jessica Rose Clark has a very speedy recovery, and I look forward to seeing her back in the octagon as well. Overall, great card. I would say the card itself, top to bottom, I would give like a 7.5, maybe an 8, just because the top two performances were so dominant. Sometimes it's easy to lose interest when you're seeing just a dominant 50 minutes of fighting, uh, and that's what it was in the co-main and main events. So again, thank you for the support. I really appreciate it. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, smash that bell for notifications if you haven't already, and I will see you later in the week whenever we go over the upcoming fight card. Thanks again.